First John chapter four, verse nine is where we are. We're gonna jump back up real quick though to verse seven and start there. First John chapter four, begin in verse seven, and then we will go on down through as much of the chapter as we can. The plan is to go to the end of the chapter. Hey, you're not on the right screen. The Bible's on the bottom screen, it needs to be on the top screen, you see. on the button to make it actually fit on the screen that's pretty good because usually it's all like blown up and I can't I mess up and leave like half the verse cut off so that works okay here we go beloved let us love one another this is what John says for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You have to keep in mind that John is dealing with some imposters uh, in the church, and he's saying that the way to distinguish between who was an imposter versus who was an a individual who knew God was love because these other individuals they wanted to introduce a uh, a gospel of hatred almost because if you recall as we talked about before and shown in the various passages these individuals did not love their enemy they might have loved who they considered to be their neighbor but they didn't love their enemy like what Jesus told them to do and as we're going to see in a moment uh, whenever God wants us to love. He doesn't just want us to love people that we know. He wants us to love people that we don't know, inclusive of the people that are hostile towards us. And Christians, even today, who wish to, uh, who wish to attack those physically that they disagree with or that might be hostile towards them, don't know God, uh, like what he's saying here in 1 John chapter 4, and verses 7 and 8. Because you have individuals who want to take up arms in the name of Christ. But that's never something that Jesus prescribed. And it's never something that he wanted his kingdom to do. The old covenant kingdom worked in that way. But the new covenant kingdom does not work in that way. And so we know that the individuals who do not love do not know God. For God is love. Now we've uh, probably done this before. But just to remind you. Because I, I think it's really important. Jesus as we know. Is a, uh, is a manifestation of who God really is. As uh, the book of John says, Jesus explains God. And 1 Corinthians 13, just to bring this back to your attention, and then we're going to go back to 1 John, talks about love quite a bit. Love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, love does not brag, is not arrogant, on and on and on and on. And what you can do to really understand who God is, as revealed by Jesus, is go through each of those expressions uh, offered in First John chapter, rather in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and instead of the word love, put the word God in there, and that'll really show you who God is uh, from from Jesus's perspective, the God whom Jesus reveals. So First John chapter four, verse seven and eight tells us that God is love. Now let's move on to verse eight, verse nine. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. So as you see here, God's love is manifested in a couple of ways. God's love is first manifested in him sending his son. But then his love is manifested in us whenever we live in response to his son. As he says at the end of this passage, so that we might live through him. So God's love is shown towards uh, towards Jesus's, rather, rather, towards us through Jesus. 
But then God's love is also show, shown to the world through us whenever we lay down our lives uh, following in the footsteps of Jesus' love. So God's love is shown towards us through Christ, and God's love is shown to the world through us. That is, so that we might live through him. And so this is what John meant uh, earlier in the book when he talked about walking in the light as he is in the light. God is a light to the world, and we are a way that God manifests that light, which is why it's so important to abstain from sin. Because whenever we sin, we are not being the type of light that we ought to be. So, uh, verse that's verse 9. Anybody have any comments on verse 9? i got a couple of passages that I want to go to, but do you have anything before we move on to those texts? Okay. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. And we'll see the type of love that God manifested and the type of love that we ought to manifest as well. Romans chapter 5. Look here at verse, uh, verse 6. He says, While we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates, he commands, is how King James puts it, his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, we, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The big point here that Paul is trying to make is that uh, Christ died not just for those who were already righteous. He died for his enemies. He died for us while we were yet sinners. Which shows us that uh, it's God's righteousness that saves us, not our righteousness. Uh, our righteousness is simply a response to God's righteousness and letting Christ live through us, like what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. It's no longer him that lives, but Christ lived through him. God was faithful on his end, and it's up to us to simply accept that gift. Now, there are those who reject this gift and who live life contrary to God's will, which is to love him and to love our neighbor. And those individuals don't know what it means to love and don't have God's love uh, in, in their life. But that doesn't mean that there's no hope for them. They still have opportunities through uh, through God's grace, to be reconciled uh, to him. But until one does that, uh, they live contrary to God's will. But that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't die for them, as we're going to see here in a, uh, in a little bit. When you look here at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, and you read that uh, about God's only begotten Son, uh, that's an obvious reference to what passage? Yeah, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, our belief in Christ, our faith in Christ, produces biblical love, not only for our, uh, our neighbor, those who, we, those who we know, but also for the neighbors that we don't know, and even our enemies that persecute us. So God's, God's love that he demonstrates towards us brings... Uh, brings a desire in us to show love towards those around us. So that's, that's the main message of, uh, of 1 John. And those individuals who were following Christ for the perks without any radical transformation in their life, he says those individuals weren't really of them because they didn't really love. They didn't have the type of love that Jesus manifested for us. And Jesus' love that he manifested for us was, was that he died for us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet ungodly. And that's the type of love we should have towards our towards our uh, neighbor. Now, he says in verse 10, listen to this closely. Uh, this kind of gets into it a little bit more. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So again, Christ died for us while we were yet ungodly. God loves us even when we're separated from him. God loves us even when we're not doing his will. He still loves us, and he wants us to be reconciled to him through his son. 
Now, here's an important po point we need to make. When he says in verse 10 that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, John is looking at this from the perspective of being outside of Christ before he loved God, right? In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So Jesus didn't just die for individuals who would end up believing in him. Jesus died for everybody. And this is the point that John makes in 1 John chapter 2. If you take a look at that, uh, he uses that word propitiation there as well. And he says in verses 1 and 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So there's an idea uh, that exists of uh, what's called limited atonement. That is that Jesus only died for the, the end group, the elect group. But that's not how I, that's not the way that I see it. it. It looks to me that Jesus died for every single individual before they ever knew him and if they would ever know them, if they, if they would ever know him, even if they go their whole lives rejecting Jesus, there's still always that possibility of reconciliation if they would accept the gift, right? And that's, that's I think, is, a, uh, is an important uh, distinction. So, uh, God sends his son, not just for those whom he love, not just for those who love him, but also for those who even hate him, uh, those who live against him. Christ loves them equally, and he died for them just the same. It's up to them whether or not they wish to respond uh, to that love in this life. All right, let's look down a little bit to verse 21, uh, or rather uh, verse 19, sorry. In verse 19 of 1 John chapter 4, he says, We love because he first loved us. Good morning, Zella. We love because he first loved us. So again, this is not a, uh, a relationship that was, that was two-sided to begin with. This was a one-sided relationship with God loving us and wanting us to be reconciled to him and us rejecting him and turning away from him all the way. You see, it started off one-sided in hopes that it would be two-sided, in hopes that we would return the love towards him uh, by changing our lives for the better. But it starts off with God loving, God beckoning towards us, God calling out for us, all the while we reject him. But then hopefully it ends up in reconciliation to where we listen to that call and we turn to him and change our life for the better. So that's First John chapter two and verse nine, or First John chapter four and verse nine. Anybody have any comments on that passage there? All right, verse ten. He says, "All right, rather uh, verse eleven, uh, beloved, if God so loved us, here's his point. We also ought to love one another." And that means loved us despite each other's sins and shortcomings and mistakes. See, we're to extend love towards everybody, both the righteous and the unrighteous, because that's what God has done towards us through his son. Look at Luke chapter 6, passage that we went to maybe a couple weeks ago. But in uh, Luke chapter 6, Jesus is talking about this uh, same sort of thing. He says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 35 and 36 but love your enemies do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men be merciful just as your father is merciful so in first john 4 this love doesn't just extend to those again who are who are uh, kind to us, but even to those who are unkind, because that's the kind of love that God has shown towards us through His Son. God loves us even whenever we're the most uh, unlovable type of people. And that's the kind of love that we should extend as well. Now, let's look at verse 12. He says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. It's 1 John 4, verse 12. So although you have not seen God is what he's saying. If you love someone, if you love another, then God abides in you and your love is perfected in you. So you might not see him, but he's there. And he's there because 
you have a relationship with him through your love for him and your love for your neighbor, right? So although you can't see God, God is evident in love. Now, I think we t- talked about this uh, before, but let me draw it up here f- for you again. There it goes. Sure. Right. That's right. That's right. And and also, um, also we are we know that we can see God in others too, right? So not only should we be, should God see us, but we should be able to see God in others, like in Matthew twenty five. You know, with you did the least, you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. I think it was Mother Teresa said that. Uh, when she was on the streets, you know, helping out these individuals who are deathly ill, that's where she saw the face of God the most, you know, was, was at the poor people staring back at her. Um, <clears throat> so we have a little science lesson here. We have uh, oxygen and we have hydrogen, two hydrogen uh, atoms, right? What is it that connects these things, these thing, this, this molecule together to make water? Well, one has a positive charge, the other has a negative charge, and they're drawn together, right? See, it's this, it's this connectedness, it's this attraction, this love that's at the center of our universe, right? Everything is bound up together in love. And so when we think about when you love, you know God. That's because at the very base of all our reality, it's bound together through attraction, through togetherness, through reconciliation, right? It takes things coming together. And so love is natural, whereas hate, which is a separation, which is a division, is, is unnatural, right? Uh, whenever, you, whenever you introduce discord into a community or into a relationship or whatever it is, and you're breaking things up, that's unnatural. I saw one person did an illustration where they took a salt shaker and a pepper shaker and they uh, put rubber cement between the two and stuck them together to sort of symbolize a marriage relationship. And he says, it's meant to come together, it's not meant to take apart. Because when you take it apart, what happens to the salt and pepper shaker? It breaks and all the salt and pepper spill out you know, onto the floor. And so that's, that's what love is. Love is bringing everything together. Hate is unnatural. It's what separates things, all right? And God is, is at the very center of our uni- universe, bringing everything together. This is what Paul called the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5. It's our job as Christians then to share that love for the world to bring reconciliation about. If we sow discord, what we're doing is the exact opposite of what God would have us to do. And that's why there's so much anxiety uh, and things like that tied into religious systems which are bent on creating and, and, and tend to create more and more divisions. There's so much anxiety tied up in that mindset because it's going against God's will. It's going against what we designed to do, which is to reconcile people, not to separate people and break people up. So, Ashley? Right. And I guess there's different variations of under that umbrella as to what, you know, they believe, teach, whatever. So I'm not necessarily drawing any conclusion per se. I'm still trying to figure it out. Sure. But in some in some perspectives, it seems like people want you to love them on their condition. And what I mean by that is if you say anything that they do is wrong. Right. Then in their mind, you don't love them. You should just right. accept whatever they want to do, however they see the world, their view of things. You should accept that. And if you don't, then you don't love them. Right. And so that's like when I read these verses, I, I see the society we, we're in now. It's like they everything should be accepted. If you don't, you're the bad person. Right. They want to attack, you know. Anyone who would 
Well, see, the thing is, is that uh, the thing is, is that in First John, you still have this call to walk in light and not to walk in darkness, and that comes down to ultimately, as as Paul says in Romans thirteen, all the commandments are summed up in this one: to love your neighbor as yourself, because love can do no wrong to your neighbor. So the unfortunate thing about labels like progressive or conservative or liberal or whatever is that most of the time those are used you know to to almost to either deter people or appeal to a certain crowd and so somebody might label themselves progressive to appeal to a certain crowd but not really be progressing anywhere but into more chaos right or more division Someone might call themselves conservative to appeal to a certain crowd, but at the end of the day, the things they're trying to conserve are not very uh, conservative at all. They're, they go to destruction, right? So when we're trying to look at the world today and we're thinking about all these labels, progressive, liberal, conservative, radical, whatever, they're used in different contexts to paint pictures and it can kind of skew the whole thing. So here's what we have to keep in mind. Now, regardless, we're to love every single person, even if they are just, as Peter told all uh, the sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. We're still to love that person. But love does not mean approval of everything that that, everything that, that individual does. In fact, love can mean disapproving of what an individual does if it is destructive towards themselves or destructive towards their neighbor. And that's, I think, the dividing line. And so... There are things that we have access to today that we didn't have access to 2,000 years ago. Cell phones, the internet, stuff like that. And so how do you use the Bible, which was written in a world that those things didn't even exist or hadn't even been thought up, how do you use the Bible to, to navigate those type of new inventions and things like that? Well, it's through Paul's summary of it all, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself. And so whenever things come up in our society, that might not have been manifested in the same way 2,000 years ago, how do we deal with that? Well, it would, would approving or disapprove of this thing, would it be you know, under the category of loving your neighbor as yourself, loving your enemies? Now, <clears throat> there are certain actions, and you know, as Paul gives us various lists within his different letters that are universally wrong like murder and th stealing yeah somebody asked me they said well daniel you're preaching this message uh to love your enemy to love your neighbor well even a thief loves his neighbor and i'm going how is a thief going to love his neighbor why would he steal from him if you know if he's loving his neighbor so they look at this message of love kind of like what you had pointed out yeah. just accept of anything but love wouldn't steal from your neighbor love wouldn't hurt a little kid you know, love wouldn't hurt anybody, right? And so that's, you know, hurt anybody in a malicious sense. Um, obviously, you know, discipline hurts, right? <laughs> but not in a malicious kind of way. So, you know, thinking about that, Ashley, it's, a, it's, it's tough to do because people have taken this word love and, and turned it into accept no matter what, you know? And that's not what love, uh, that's not what biblical love is. God loves the world, but he expects us to change. He expects us to repent, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't separate repentance from love, and that's what a lot of people have tried to do. So. I mean, even if you, were, even if you say, I disagree, like, in a, just, like we're just having a dialogue. And right. Point out, well, Daniel, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, they will label people as they hate people. They, you know, just like all these crazy stuff. And it's like, since when nobody agrees with a person on That's so right. Why do we throw these crazy labels out on people because they don't yeah. just wholeheartedly support what we want to do? Well, right. we have a tendency to create divisions so that we can alienate people and uh, you know make ourselves feel better. Is what a lot of it comes down to. You John, want to add, you want to add 
take it as well, but you're not so irascible, you give up the fat, you're not so crazy right. to take it early. And she's going to go along with what I say is, and everybody's going to be against me, I'm going to be a bad person then, you know? Huh. Yeah, so we do have that kind of eye for an eye mentality uh, in many cases, don't we? Is that a Oh, right. Galatians, what is it, 6 or something like that? Yeah, and um, if you love me and you're my brother and sister, I might do get, kind of, I, I mean, I'm not going to look at it and going to say every time you come to me that I'm going to feel great because you told me what was wrong. Right. But as time goes and I can be able to think about it, I might not like it at that point, but I'm going to come back and tell you, hey, you're right, you're right, I was wrong. Right. You know, Maybe that's something then that we need to work on uh, as individuals is not just on being willing to give correction, but being willing to receive correction gracefully. Mm -hmm. And that comes down to being open to being wrong and understanding that we're fallible, which is a really hard thing to accept because we've tied being right to being uh, saved. And being right is not the same thing as being saved because somebody can have all the facts and not live them out at all. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a discussion for later on in the sermon. Okay. If God loved us, we also ought to love one another. Oh, we're down to verse 13. Okay. But, oh, sorry. Keep going. Would you say that a brother or sister loves you and they know that you're doing wrong and they never come say anything to you? I guess it would depend on what I was doing that was wrong. I mean, if I was doing a something that was really awful or something that was destructive to myself or to someone else, you know, they might come and uh, come and come and tell you. But I guess it, I mean, if you mean wrong is in sin, then yeah, if you're doing something sinful and somebody doesn't come to you, I don't think that they could really say that they love you. But yeah, so I, I would yeah, if somebody sees you doing wrong and they don't come into you and say something, I don't know if they could really say that they love you. But there's also a sense, there's also times when the situation is so delicate that right then is not the best time to tell them, and it might be later. And so intentionally waiting to a more opportune time might be seen as not telling them, but it might be the more loving of the options. You know, if it's something like Jesus said, for example, there are things I want to tell you, but you can't handle them just yet, you know. And so... There might be a situation where someone's doing wrong, but addressing them in front of everybody might not be the best thing. You might need to wait till you get back out in the car and then tell them, you know, or something like that. So I, I, you have to use your judgment on it. Johnny? Right. You can use your judgment on that too at the same time. Let's say, hey, Paul said you've got a spiritual. If a person is overtaken with a fault, you've right. got a spiritual. Go to that person. Yes. You tell that person, a lot of that person has already been told five or five and they're going to be wrong. Yes. You know, so there's no sense to me going to them saying the same thing. Listen to those people, they're not going to listen to me. The, but at the same time, if someone goes to that individual, they should be spiritual minded. They should be able to know how to approach that person. And, and Jesus gives an order of how to carry that out, doesn't he? In Matthew 18, you go to the person, you, you know, then you take a brother with you or you know, a sister with you, and then you take it before the church. So there is a process to go in that. Zelda? Yes. Right. Well, here's something that somebody told me, because uh, they said, because uh, I'd said, I don't know if I want to write on that. Everybody's already written on it. He says, yeah, but you haven't written on it, you know. And so there's, sometimes you can only, you know, some, 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 sometimes the, the thing that someone needs you know, can only be given by you and you alone, you know. So you might, you might be the only one in the world that could reach that person. So you shouldn't give up on an opportunity just because everybody else has already tried because you're a unique individual. Um, all right, let's look at verse 13. He says, 
Uh, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John 4, 13, 14. So, as you know, they had, uh, there were a plethora of spiritual gifts being performed among the Christians in the first century. And that was one thing that they could use to distinguish between an individual who was in Christ and an individual who was not. He also says here, well, let me talk about that for just a little bit more in verse 13. Do you remember the situation where the disciples came to Jesus and they said, hey, uh, this fellow over here, he's casting out demons and he's not of us, you know? What would Jesus say? He said, leave him alone. If he's not against us, he's for us. So I think it's important that we learn to discern God working through individuals, even though they may not be specifically of us. They may not think exactly like we do or walk the same paths that we walk, but they are individuals who are doing good in the world, that, that are doing it in the name of Christ. And I think sometimes we have to be able to take a step back and say, okay, that person's doing God's will in that situation, and you know, I don't need to come between them and what God's doing through them, apparently. You know, So, like Jesus, we need to be willing to say that if they're not against us, they're for us. There, there's way too, too many people that are against us to be worried about the few that are trying to do things right that are, you know, that are really for us. I think we've focused so, many, so much time and effort on those individuals, and we've left all these people who are against us just, you know, just have their way. I, there's so much awful things in the world and, uh, and good that needs to be done that we can't really afford to lose all this time bickering over things that at the end of the day are inconsequential, you know? There's too much, there's too much to be done. Okay, verse 14. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We've looked into that a little bit. He was the propitiation of our, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Verse 15. Again, the two things that Paul really is, rather that John is really interested in in the book of 1 John is affirming that Jesus had come in the flesh and showing love to one another. He says in 16, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. You see that there in verse 16? Abiding in love. Again, love is not just a fuzzy feeling. Love is action. Love is something that you live it's not just something, it's, it's, it's your house. It's not just something that you do every once in a while, but it's a constant state of being because that's who God is. God is love, so we ought to be love as well. That should be the defining characteristic of us. Uh, by this, he says in verse 17, <clears throat> love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. Let's go to Romans chapter 2 for just a second. I want to show you a little something extra. Romans chapter 2. He's talking about having confidence in the time of judgment, and the dead judgment. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 through 16, we read this. Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts uh, alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. You see that there? There them being able to do the things of the law without having the law would defend their conscience when they would stand before God to be judged, right? And as Paul talked about, the entire law is summed up in this, love your neighbor. Love does no wrong to their neighbor. So Paul is saying here that the Gentiles, though they did not have the law, they didn't have all the same language uh, for God and ritual for God like what the Jews had, but when they did the things in the law, that is the commandments, the, to love your neighbor, then God treated them as if they were under the law. 
he showed favor to them just like he would have uh, if they were living under the law of Moses. And he said their conscience would either accuse or defend them in that uh, on, at, rather at the time whenever God would judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So here in 1 John chapter 4, we have this uh, principle stated again, that individuals who are abiding in love abide in God and God in them. Uh, there's 1 John chapter uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. And so John, what John is telling the church there is, look, if you're loving your neighbor, when it comes time for judgment, you have nothing to worry about because you've lived as God is in the world, right? He says, because as he is, so also are we in this world. God is love. He showed love towards everybody through sending Jesus. And in mimicking that and laying down their own lives for those around them, he said that you have nothing to worry about. You have confidence. See, the confidence... Uh, the confidence here is through understanding God's love because if you, if you love your neighbor, uh, it's in response to God loving you. And so having confidence in God's love by living a life of love means you have nothing to fear when it comes time to judgment. So I think a lot of times we get caught up in the particulars. Are we doing this or that specifically right? Where at the end of the day, the thing that really matters is are we loving our neighbor as ourself? And that is the thing that gives us no doubts whatsoever. Ashley? Um, I know it, it, it was specified Gentiles, but this verse 15 where it talks about God's law written in their hearts and their own conscience and thoughts will either convict them or um, I guess an application in theory that would be for all of us, correct? Right. Okay. And this verse 15 where it's mine says Sure. So, I believe so. Because okay. it's appointed to man wants to die and after this comes judgment. Okay. Yeah, and so, you know, when, when we die, right, Hebrews chapter 9 says, mm -hmm. after this comes judgment. Mm -hmm. And so, and even we're being judged right now because Jesus says, he that rejects and receives not my word has one that judges him, right? And so, uh, we are, <clears throat> when he talks about the law written on their heart, you might wonder how that would come about. But even Jesus pointed at nature as a way to show that you're to love your enemies. God sends rain on the just and the unjust is what he said in Matthew 5. And so individuals could look at nature and discern that they needed to respond to God even though they might not know, they might not have special revelation. That is a scripture to read and to study. They still knew that they needed to live a certain kind of life in response to this thing out there that was way bigger than themselves. And uh, that's what Paul gets into in Acts 17. You know, he tells the people in Athens, you know, um, he tells the people in Athens that in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So they had these ideas about there must be a God out there, and so we better make an altar that says to the unknown God, because we don't know who he is, but we want to make sure our bases are covered. So they knew that there had to be something else. They just didn't have the exact language for it. And what Paul does is he says, well, let me tell you who that is. Let me introduce you to who that God is that you're so desperate to know. But what would have happened if they would have died before Paul got there? Well, as he said, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He overlooked it. He wasn't too concerned with it. God was willing to remain anonymous at times in history uh, when individuals had no way to access his law or his scripture or his word. And so uh, there, there's, as Paul gets into in Romans 2, when individuals in that day live lives trying to follow God, you know, through looking at nature and seeing the, what, what it was, how they ought to live, God was patient with them in that, you know, even though they didn't have the law. They had the law that was written on their hearts, their conscience, and their conscience would have defend them or accuse them at a time of judgment, right? Okay, anybody have any thoughts? Uh, on that before we move on. What time is it here? 10, 16? Okay, we got, we can probably finish up the chapter. He says in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. 
and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So he says, perfect love casts out fear. When we then live lives based in fear, our only response to God is through fear. That means we're not mature yet. It means we haven't reached the type of maturity in Christ. Because a lot of people, you ask them, why are you doing this? Well, I just don't want to go to hell. Well, that's not real conversion. Uh, that's not real, that's not perfected Christian faith. Perfected Christian faith casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love, as he says in verse 19, not because we're afraid of punishment, but because he first loved us. That's why we love. Not to avoid, uh, not, we, we don't love to avoid punishment. We love uh, to embrace life that's offered to us. And that's why he talks about confidence. And I saw Peter talks about making your calling and election sure and, and knowing God and knowing that you have eternal life, right? And knowing that you're more than conqueror. So all these passages are trying to get us to understand this isn't something you have to say, well, I hope I go to heaven. It should be, it should be a solid fact in your mind that that's where you're going. No fear, no doubt, no question at all. Because the determining factor is, do you love? And if you love, then there's nothing that you ought to uh, worry about. He says in verse 20, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It's impossible for us to at the same time love God and also hate. We have to be full love or nothing. Because if we don't have that kind of love, then we can't really say that we know who God is. We can't say that we love God and hate our brother. That's why Jesus gave those two commandments. To love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? You can't have one without the other. It's impossible to love God and hate your neighbor. At the same time, it's impossible uh, to show love for your neighbor and hate God. It has, it's a total uh, package. You can't love God and hate your neighbor, and you can't love your neighbor and hate God. It's both working together that produces life. And finally, he says in verse 21, And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. And that's John's point in much of this letter, is to try to get the people to live lives of love. Perfect love casts out fear, as we saw in verse 18, because uh, we love because he first loved us, and it's impossible to say that you love God and hate your brother at the same time. We have to show complete love towards everyone, or we haven't really reached perfection. And so there's always room there's always room, of course, to improve because there's always people being born. So there's no end to the amount of love that you can show. All right. Does anybody have any comments on 1 John chapter 4, 9 through 21? All right, then. I'll go ahead and stop the recording there.